Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accessibility Talks. This is the monthly virtual meetup where we chat about digital accessibility, inclusivity, and usability. Each month, we invite a speaker to present a topic, and afterward, we invite the community to ask questions and participate in the discussion. I am today's host, Andrew Olson. I go by Andrew or Andy. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a friend and software engineer at Principal Financial Group. I enjoy front-end development and the challenge of making the web accessible for everyone on any device. I'm thrilled to be part of the Alley Talks team in hosting today's discussion. Today, um, we will hopefully be having a live transcript. Uh, on your screen, there is a, a link and uh, also a QR code. We're a little delayed, but we're hoping to correct that and have the live captioner join as soon as they can. But in the meantime, I'd like to move on and, and we will let you know once that transcript is available via the chat. That said, I wanna take a moment to remind folks that our group seeks to provide a friendly and safe environment. We require all participants to adhere to the Accessibility Talks Code of Conduct. This applies to all community interactions and events, and this also applies to verbal questions as well as chat and text channels. This code of conduct can be found on our website, alleytalks.com. That's A-1-1-Y-T-A-L-K-S dot C-O-M. All participants should be able to engage in productive dialogue and should share and learn with each other in an atmosphere of mutual respect. If you have any questions for our speaker today, please post it. Uh, you can post it on X with the hashtag of Alley Talks. Again, that's hashtag A11YTALKS. Or if you're participating in the live chat, you can add your question to the YouTube chat window and we'll get to it at the end of the discussion. So with that, Let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Jesse Loesberg. His pronouns, pronouns are he, him. He is an award-winning web designer, developer, and IAAP certified professional in web accessibility with 15 plus years of experience designing and building WordPress, Drupal, and standalone websites. He's currently a web developer at University of California Berkeley Library. And a fun fact about Jesse is that he's been an avid knitter for over 20 years and has just restarted piano lessons after a 40-year hiatus. So my first question to you, Jesse, is do you have any examples of your knitting work around you? I'm putting uh, on spot. Sure. Uh, not the most um, exciting one. <laughs> this just happens to be on my desk, but uh, this, is a, this is a hat. Uh, I live in Oregon. My desk is by this sliding screen door so it's cold where I sit so I generally have a hat on my desk and not only did I knit this hat but I designed I designed this hat it's one of one of my first designs for, for bald heads like that is outstanding. So, yeah sure fairly coincidentally I had one of my own I, I guess that's probably more common than I think <laughs> that's great uh also my next question is is there a song or an event that inspired you to pick up the piano lessons at this point in your life Oh, that you know, that's that's a great question. Uh, so many songs. Mostly, I really just wanted to get back to music, and I uh, wanted something in my life that I could really, really focus on. That when I was working on it, it would kind of just make the whole world go away. But uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, um, embarrassed uh, to, or maybe shouldn't be embarrassed to say that I do um, have an unabashed love for Phil Collins that I generally keep secret um but he's got he i some of his, his piano work is actually really spectacular so there's a few old phil collins songs that i really wanted to you know be able to play not ironically although to most people i would say that i was playing it ironically that's you know you gotta you gotta find that and play that that's that's outstanding exactly. um as a musician uh i i grew up a drummer then the bass and then guitar. So I love to play all the things and uh, I love music. So that is outstanding that you're picking it up and, and playing what you love. So do not be afraid to uh, <laughs> play Phil Collins in front of people. If they think it's ironic, that's on them. You, you play what you need. I appreciate that. All right. 
with that, um, I also realized I missed uh, some slides because I was too excited about um, going through the introduction. I just want to call out really quickly the Alley Cat Club members. So we do have um, the Alley Cat Club. So uh, just wanted to bring that back up. Apologies. So we want to thank you for the Alley Cat Club members that uh, give donations and make this possible. So again, today, being able to put on this live stream to have a wonderful website and to have live captioning when available. Um, thank you to Carrie, Simo, Rajab, uh, myself. I'm an Alley Cat Club member. You can be too. Uh, Alyssa, April, and Steve Woodson. So if you want more information about that, you can go to our website. So thanks for letting me backtrack a little bit here, Jesse, but um, no problem. very important because uh, that's how we're able to bring you and have you come on and bring this wonderful topic. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, I'll go off the screen here and we'll collect some great questions uh, in the YouTube chat and take it away, Jesse. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, like Andrew said, my name is Jesse Loesberg, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a web designer and developer with the UC Berkeley Library. UC, for those of you who may not know, stands for the University of California. Um, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the um, accessibility mindset. And uh, before I jump in, I'm going to give a little bit uh, of background on my own uh, personal experience with um, disability. Um, I've uh, stuttered um, ever since I could speak, really. Um, uh, stuttered my, my whole life. It does tend to go away or fade to the background when I do public speaking. It's one of the reasons why I love public speaking um, so much, because I do get to experience the the feeling of fluid speech uh which um doesn't happen uh too much in um other uh, in um, other uh parts of my life but that's been an um an aspect of my life as long as i can remember also about four and a half years ago i was in a pretty serious uh bike accident i was uh, hit from um behind by a car i was wearing my helmet but i still uh sustained a um traumatic brain injury uh, and although uh, my body was more or less fine after that, um, I um, do have some uh, mild cognitive issues as a result and also seizures. So um, my uh, experience with um, disability has um, expanded in um, recent years. Uh, but to jump into the talk, uh, I'm um, going to um, start with stuttering and uh, my speech. And the first thing I'm going to show you is um, this. This is a um, telephone. This is an old style red telephone. By the way, for the folks in the audience who may be visually impaired, I'm going to be describing uh, most of the um, images that I'll be showing. This is a very uh, old telephone. It's got a um, handheld receiver that you lift off the cradle. It's got a dial that you actually have to put your fingers into and turn. Uh, depending on your age, you may be looking at this and having a very tactile memory of what it felt like to turn that dial, to actually like, you know, force that dial back and feel those um, clicks as they, as they, as they turned. Um, uh, so this is the kind of telephone that I grew up with. But um, uh, I'm going to pose uh, a very specific question about this telephone. And that question is, who is this made for? Who is this telephone made for? Uh, and there's a technology related answer to that question. And the answer is, it's for people who want to verbally communicate with somebody who also has a telephone who is not physically present. Simple answer, right? You uh, want to talk to someone who isn't there, who also has a phone. You pick up this phone, you dial the number on the phone, and you talk to them. And that answer still still applies to our um, phones, even though phones have uh, changed a lot since the days where we used this kind of phone. So that is an answer to this question, who is this made for? Um, but I'm going to ask another question that expands the way we think about who this phone is made for. And that question is, who is able to use this? Um, and that changes things a bit. Um, 
the people who are able to use this are people who can use their hands and their fingers because you need to be able to use your hands and your fingers to put to pick up that receiver and hold it to your ear and your mouth. You need to be able to use your fingers to turn that dial, which means you need to have the dexterity to use the dial and you need to have the hand strength to use the dial. If you remember these dials, it took no small amount of hand strength to do. It is also for people who can see, you need to be able to see the numbers and the letters so you know what number you are dialing. It's also for people who can hear because you are holding this receiver up to your ear and you need to be able to hear the voice that is coming through on the other side. And it's also for people who can speak. Um, that uh, the other part of the receiver is of course the microphone. You're holding it up to your mouth and you are speaking. So who is able to use this? People who can use their hands and their fingers, people who can see, people who can hear, and people who can speak. So when we ask who is this for, it's not really just for people who want to verbally speak to somebody who isn't physically present in the room and also has a telephone. It's also people who match this criteria. And for me personally, the speaking part was particularly challenging. So from my perspective, this was also for people who were fluent speakers, because unlike public speaking, the telephone has the opposite effect on me. When I pick up the telephone, my speech gets much, much, much worse. I'm, um, my, uh, my, my, uh, repetitions get, get more intense. The blocks, as in when I'm trying to say a word and can't say it, become much more intense. Saying my name for all kinds of mysterious reasons that I don't understand becomes much more difficult on the phone. So this made life pretty difficult for me as a young person. My first job out of college was in a bookstore and interacting with customers in person was not a big deal, but people would call on the phone and the phone would ring and my boss would say, hey, Jesse, go pick up that phone, which for most people, no big deal. But for me, that generated a lot of anxiety because I really didn't know how it was going to go when I picked up that receiver because the phone, I didn't think of it this way at the time, but the phone was not built for me. The phone was built for fluent speakers. And what that meant was when my boss said, hey, Jesse, go pick up that phone, I would look at the phone and see this. And what this is, is a hand-drawn rendering of some kind of medieval torture device. It is a chair with spikes on it. There are restraints for the wrists. There's some kind of device at the ankles that I imagine is that looks like propellers, is probably supposed to inflict intense pain on the ankles. And then there's like another roller with spikes that I don't even know what it does, but I'm sure it's super painful. And this is what telephones were like for me. I did not like using telephones. I did not want to use the telephone. Uh, but I also felt like I personally was falling short by not being able to use the telephone. I didn't have the frame of mind that I have now, which is I was not failing the technology. The technology was failing me. This is how I think of these things now and how I'm going to encourage everybody, all of us, to think about technology, that the people who are not able to use it are not failing it. It is probably failing them. So I'm going to have us ask the question, who is this made for about another thing? Things that most of us probably use every day and you are probably sitting in front of right now. This is a picture of a desktop computer. There is a flat screen monitor and a mouse and a keyboard. So when we ask the question, who is this made for? The initial technology related answer, like with the telephone, is this is made for people who want to send email, use the internet, do word processing. I don't think we even say the word word processing anymore. I'm probably dating myself with that phrase. But think about all the tasks that people do on a computer. You'd think this is for people who want to do the things you do on a computer. But let's ask that next question and ask who is able to use this? And again, we get a different perspective on this piece of technology that we use every day. The screen is for people who can see, who are able to perceive color and also read. It's also for people who can use their hands and their fingers. The mouse, you need to have use of your hand and your arm and the dexterity to use the mouse. 
Same with the keyboard. You need to be able to use your hands. You can do it with one hand, but a keyboard like this is really built for people who have full use of both their hands, full use of their fingers, generally all 10 fingers, and the dexterity required to use that keyboard. So this again, with this question, becomes a very different thing. This computer, as it is constructed here, as we are looking at it, is really only for a subset of the human population. There's lots of people who don't meet the criteria required to use this computer, which is how we get into what is generally referred to as um, assistive technology. And assistive technology, as we generally think about it, as most of y'all uh, watching this probably know, is technology that helps people who don't match this criteria we see here to still use the computer. And here are some examples of assistive technology. There are four pictures here. I'm going to describe them in clockwise order from the top left. In the top left corner, we see a braille screen, uh, a braille reader. A braille reader is something that hooks up to your uh, computer. It has a, a set of spaces with little holes on them. Little uh, pegs come up in the holes that create Braille characters that allow uh, Braille users and visually impaired users who read Braille to perceive what is on the screen through their fingers line by line. Um, continuing on in the top right, we have a single-handed keyboard. This is a keyboard that has all the functionality of what we would call a standard keyboard, but easily accessible by only using one hand. Uh, on the um, bottom right, we have a picture of a person sitting at a uh, desk with a computer screen on it. There is no keyboard. Uh, they are sitting in a chair with a lot of assistive devices on it. You can't tell from the picture necessarily, but what is being used here is eye tracking. This is a computer that uses eye tracking to use a mouse cursor based on where um, a person is looking at the screen. And then continuing around in the bottom left, we have another picture of someone sitting at a computer um, with their finger um, pointed at the screen. They do have a keyboard present, but they also have a microphone. And again, you can't necessarily tell from the picture, but this is, um, uh, this is a uh, picture of someone operating a computer with voice commands. Voice commands are a lot like, um, um, uh, keyboard commands, if you are someone who uses a, 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 a keyboard entirely to access the computer without a mouse, voice commands perform the same actions that keyboard commands do, but with the voice instead of with a keyboard. So these are examples of assistive technology that people with certain disabilities would use with a computer. And that is generally how we think of the term assistive technology. It's for a very specific group of people, people with disabilities, to do a particular task. But I like to try to broaden our sense of the term assistive technology beyond how it's generally used. Now, um, I wear glasses. Uh, I'm wearing glasses right now. Um, there are probably many of you watching um, this uh, presentation right now who are also wearing glasses. And if you are a person wearing glasses who would not be able to perform certain tasks without your glasses, like reading or driving or anything, if uh, your um, level of um, uh, visual ability is such that you really couldn't conduct the basic activities of your life without your glasses, Guess what? Your glasses are assistive technology. And generally, when we think of assistive technology, we think of the things that are on my screen right now, the things that I just described. But really, anything that helps you perform a basic life activity that you would not be able to perform unless you had that thing, that is assistive technology. And thinking of it that way, really helps us to broaden our concept of how technology serves people and who it is serving. Because we generally think of people with disabilities as a category of people. And legally, it is a category of people. And there's a medical aspect to that category of people. But really, technology is designed to serve everybody. It is designed to help everybody do certain activities 
in their life. And some of the activities it helps us do are things that are not basic life activities, but a lot of them are, or thanks to our smartphones, they have become <laughs> basic life activities. But technology is meant to serve everybody, regardless of whether you exist in the category, the cultural category of disability. So when we ask the question of any piece of technology, who is this made for? And we ask this about the technology that we create ourselves, whether you are creating a device, whether that is your job, or whether you're responsible, responsible for the front end of a website, or the back end of a website, or working on an app, or whether you're responsible for UX and visual design. When you ask the question, who is this made for? The answer is always everyone. The things we build are for everybody. And in a perfect world, that's how it would always be. But as we know, since many of us are involved in the world of digital accessibility or accessibility in the built environment, a lot of the things that get built and the technology we create don't turn out that way. There end up being large groups of people that can't use the things that, um, that, 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 that we build simply because of the frameworks that we carry around with us in our minds, in our lives. And that doesn't mean that we are bad people. That doesn't mean that we have done something wrong. That's just how we were raised, the environments that we grew up in and how we think, which is perfectly natural. So the way we use and create technology is informed by our life experience. It's informed by our economic background. It's informed by our sexual identity. It's informed by our racial and or ethnic background, by our level of ability or disability. It's informed by where we grew up and where we live and by individual life experiences. These are really all the things that make up who we are. And these are the things that create our mental frameworks. And these are the frameworks that we bring to our work and we bring to our jobs and that we bring to uh, the technology that we build. And um, again, there's nothing wrong with that. This is part of being a human, but one of our jobs as people who create technology that are used by other people is to recognize our own mental frameworks, to identify the things in our lives that have contributed to that mental framework and then to step outside them. So in order to create technology that is truly for everyone, we need to step outside our own mental frameworks. And I'm gonna run through a few examples, um, which may be familiar to all of them, uh, of what happens when we do not do this work, when software or technology finds its way out into the world and gets used, after a process that did not involve reflection about what your life assumptions were. So this is a screenshot of a landing page from medium.com and an article from there. The headline is bad form design. First names must be at least four characters. So um, that uh, um, requiring on, uh, on a form that someone is gonna use that first name or last name or any part of the name be at least four characters, that's when it is used. It's often regarded as a security feature. Um, the assumption here is that most people's names or the assumption is that all people's names are going to be more than four characters. Obviously that's not the case. There's lots of people in the world whose names are less than four characters. There are also entire groups of people, for example, Asian people whose names when they are transliterated into English are less than three characters. Um, Kim is a very common Korean last name. That is an entire group of people who, when they tried to submit this form, would get an error, would be informed that they were not completing this form correctly. So that's an entire group of people who would not be able to use this form, who would encounter a barrier and uh, would have to uh, move on to something else, use a different product, or if this was providing a necessary service, they would not even be able to use this service. Um, also, uh, um, any Asian name that's being typed in this form is already transliterated because it's probably the case that most forms like this don't accept Asian characters. That's a whole other talk. Uh, here's another example. This is um, a landing page from motherjones.com. 
The headline of this article is, hey Siri, why don't you understand more people like me? This article is about how Siri has trouble with uh, people with different accents. Uh, that includes regionalisms right here in the United States, but it also includes obviously people from other countries who are speaking to Siri. And this is generally because the people working on the software were testing the software with people who were just like them, who spoke just like them and sounded like them and likely did not expand the user testing to people with accents who are not like theirs. Again, this produces a significant barrier to people who are from other countries, even if they speak English. Um, people from the regional South and the United States experience this all the time with technology that's created by uh, people from the West Coast. Um, this is a significant barrier to using uh, Siri on their phones, um, to uh, using any voice activated software when it is developed by people who didn't go through the reflection process of who else is going to be using the technology, these are the barriers that have resulted. And my third and final example of this, uh, this is an article from Scientific American. The headline is, Police Facial Recognition Technology Can't Tell Black People Apart. Well, you may have seen this in the news or a uh, related story. A lot of Technology like this is created by people who are white. And if they are only testing on themselves or people like themselves, then it is likely that their facial recognition technology is not going to work for darker skinned people. And then when this technology makes its way into public use, especially when it starts to involve the police, this can have very significant social consequences, which I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with. So I've ordered these examples from one with the sort of like most minimal social impact to the most significant social impact. So when I say that people who work on technology need to go through a reflection process about what their own life experience is and what their framework is and what assumptions they're bringing to their work, um, this isn't just you know me thinking about what is the best, most awesome world we can live in and how we can all be happier. We're actually talking about actual impact on people's lives and people and uh, uh, consequences that can actually be physically dangerous and in some cases fatal. So what I'm talking about can be a life or death situation. I'm not really trying to inspire fear here, but I would like to call out that this process that I'm talking about us going through is really essential to um, changing the state of our world. Because when we don't go through this reflection process and we create technology that gets broadly used, it can have um, very significant consequences. Um, so um, for a lot of kinds of technology, um, like you know, when I use the term technology broadly and talk about glasses, like I uh, did, did, did uh, before, it can be a very loose and vague thing to go through the process of how do I make this accessible to everyone. But uh, I am a web developer. I work on websites. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, web folks in the audience um, right now. We are very lucky enough to have something called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. And quite briefly, taken from the w3.org website, WCAG was developed through the W3C process in cooperation with individuals and organizations around the world with a goal of providing a single shared standard for web content accessibility that meets the needs of individuals, organizations, and governments internationally. Uh, WCAG is an, uh, is an evolving thing. It is a living document, but it does aim to do this, and it does a pretty good job. So what is WCAG at the nuts and bolts level? I'm not going to do a super deep dive because, again, you could do a lot of talks on WCAG, but I'll give an overview. WCAG is a set of four overarching principles. It is a set of guidelines for adhering to the principles. It, is a, it provides testable criteria for meeting the guidelines, and it um, provides techniques for meeting those, uh, 
those guidelines. And again, I'm not going to dive in, but I will provide what those four overarching principles are. The principles are all web content should be perceivable by everyone. Everyone who is um, using your app or your website should be able to perceive what the website is providing. All of the functionality should be operable by everyone. Everyone should be able to use your website. They should be able to use your navigation menus. If there is a form or if there's any kind of user interaction, everyone should be able to operate that interaction. All content should be understandable by everyone. And all content and functionality should be robust. And that last one means that uh, the website or app should be usable regardless of what browser is being used, regardless of what platform you're on, whether you're, you're on a phone or a desktop or a tablet. All con content and functionality should be usable in all those environments. It should be fully robust. So we can treat the WCAG guidelines as a set of boxes to be checked. And if you do that, you will um, go a long way towards creating, uh, creating a fully accessible uh, website or a fully accessible app or experience. But we can also use WCAG to change the way we think, which is that extra step that I think we should all use WCAG to Take. We can take those WCAG guidelines and not just check off the boxes, but we can also use the WCAG guidelines to ask questions about why we are applying these principles and who we are trying to serve by applying these principles. So to illustrate that, I'm uh, going to turn to my own institution, the UC Berkeley Library. UC Berkeley Library's mission statement is we help current and future users find, evaluate, use and create knowledge to better the world. So any technology that I work on, and I'm responsible for all of UC Berkeley's public facing websites and a bunch of the internal uh, websites too. When I'm working on the website, when I'm able to pull my nose up from whatever problem I'm trying to fix, this is where my sight lands. This is where my vision lands. This is where I'm ultimately this, this is the ultimate goal of my job, to help current future users find, evaluate, use, and create knowledge to better the world. So the technology that I work on needs to serve this group of people, which is, of course, as I'm always saying, everybody. So to focus in uh, on this, I'm gonna um, uh, take a look at our navigation menu. Uh, over the past few years, we've gone through a rebuild and redesign process. We launched a uh, newly designed and fully rebuilt website in May of 2022. Had many, many improvements. The first thing we're going to look at, though, is the navigation menu from our old website. This is the header and navigation menu from the website that we replaced in 2022. And I'm going to ask this question that uh, I've asked about the things we've looked at so far, which is, who is this made for? Well, this navigation menu had um, a bunch of issues. For one thing, these were, um, I, I don't have a live example of this, which uh, I, I think is good, but this is not live anymore, this site. <laughs> but uh, I'll verbally walk you through what some of the issues, the accessibility issues with this menu were. Um, the menus that have drop down arrows were hover menus. I uh, am opposed to hover menus uh, for multiple reasons. Accessibility reasons are one of them. But you hover your mouse over them and these gigantic boxes would drop down. Uh, and those menus were not, were only accessible by mouse. If you were uh, using a mobile device on which you have to tap, um, or uh, you were using the um, screen reader options that are on offer on mo mobile devices, these hover menus were not accessible to, 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 to you. Um, not only that, the hover menus um, were uh, gigantic and created what uh, I call, and I think are generally called hover tunnels, where you are required, if you want to get one of those links that are on the menu, you have to move the mouse into the menu. If you go off the menu, it disappears. Um, it's it was just an overall like horribly frustrating uh fr 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 um frustrating uh frustrating experience if you were a keyboard user and you were using the tab key you could also not get the drop down menus to show up however if you were tabbing through it 
the links that were in those drop-down menus were still accessible by the keyboard. They just didn't show up. So you would be tabbing through and your focus indicator, it would just disappear and you would be tabbing. Uh, that little bottom area in the bottom of most browsers that shows you what URL you're gonna go to when you click, that would still change, but nothing on the screen was changing. So this menu was a block for screen reader users, um, people who had a hard time using their mouse and for keyboard users. It is also very difficult for users with some visual impairments because the color contrast of this menu does not clear color contrast, WCAG color contrast requirements. This top level uh, wasn't super bad. It's, it didn't clear the guidelines, but the drop down menus, which again, I'm, you're lucky enough not to have me show you, uh, the contrast on those was not great. So when we ask the question, um, who is this made for? The answer we really get when we take all these things into consideration is this navigation menu was really made for non-visually impaired mouse users with a high cognitive threshold. And the cognitive threshold part relates to the fact that the some of um, the drop-down menus had many, many links in them that using the libraries menu when you rolled over that, at the time this website was live, the UC Berkeley library system had 27 libraries in it. So 27 links would appear very, very tiny. Uh, cognitive issues are one of the issues that I confront in using websites. I would not be able to use that menu now after my accident. That meant that drop down would appear with all those links on it. I'd be, I'd say, nope, and I would move away. And this would not be a menu that I would be able to use. So all this, of course, raises the question of how did this menu get this way? How did this website get launched with a menu like that? Well, it's because the designers and developers, one, were not visually impaired, so they themselves did not need to take this into uh, con consideration. They were able to use a mouse, so they were mostly testing with a mouse. They weren't doing just keyboard testing, and they weren't testing with a screen reader. They also inherited a navigational architecture that reflected the organization. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this. I have experienced this in other roles and other websites as well. If there isn't a reflective process about who is using the navigation menu and who the audience is and, um, and who the navigation menu is designed to serve, then your navigation menu will default to the structure of your organization. It's just sort of a natural thing. I'm sure all of us have come across navigation menus on websites where you're like, I don't understand why this menu was built this way. And if you think about it, you realize this is the, the structure of the organization that you're looking at, which only serves people in the organization. It doesn't serve the public. So since our mission statement at the library is to help all users um, access knowledge, that navigation menu really looked more like the organizational structure of the library and was not made for users. So if you are a user um, with a disability trying to access this nav menu, you've got a really high, high bar to clear. Now, again, our developers were not bad people. Um, the uh, the uh, um, developer who I have worked with for the last few years who recently retired did work on this menu. I had his permission <laughs> to go into this because he's a very nice guy and he said, oh, you're not slamming me. Don't worry. But, you know, I didn't want to feel like I was judging his work. But even though he's and it was an excellent colleague and one of the best people I've ever worked with, there is the simple fact that he had the framework that he had that he was coming to and no one was going through the process of really asking who this menu was really for. Um, and so when we ask the question, who do we want to be able to use the navigation menu? The answer of course is everyone because everyone is always the answer to this question, but we also want keyboard users to be able to use it. We want screen reader users to be able to use it. We want people with low vision to be able to use it. That's that contrast issue. And people with cognitive disabilities. We do not want a navigation menu that overwhelms. We want it to be easy to read and to use. 
So we used an outside vendor for site architecture and visual design, and we asked them these questions. What is your agency's overall approach to web accessibility? Are you familiar with WCAG? And can you provide us with examples of your work that meet WCAG guidelines? And if you work for an organization where you bring in outside vendors, these are the three questions I encourage you to ask. Um, and you need good answers to all three of those questions if you want to be able to move forward with a fully accessible result. Um, and my favorite red flag is if you ask a, uh, a vendor about accessibility and they say, oh yeah, everything we launch is 100% accessible. That, don't, don't ever use those people and run the other way. Anyone who says that is guaranteed to provide you with um, a result that is not accessible because nothing is 100% accessible. And that answer doesn't recognize the fact that accessibility is not a destination. It is a goal. It is a process. And it is something that needs to be maintained over time. Uh, nothing is 100% accessible and stays that way. So our vendor adopted the accessibility mindset by focusing on simplifying the structure of the navigation menu, which we talked about, using a high contrast color scheme, working to find straightforward, easy to understand link names, that's that cognitive stuff, and avoiding unnecessary visual design elements. Our developers, that was me and a couple other people, adopted the accessibility mindset by ensuring the navigation menu can be used with only a keyboard. The best way to do this is to unplug your mouse or put your mouse in a drawer so you don't get it and tab through the keyboard and make sure you can get everything you want to get to. Using screen reader accessible markup, making the navigation menu responsive to varying screen widths, i.e. mobile responsive. This is out of the box standard these days, but still important to keep in mind. And adhering to the style guidelines as provided by the vendor. The style guidelines were accessible as the developers, we needed to stick to them. We adopted the accessibility mindset during testing by using automated testing tools. At UC Berkeley, we use Site Improve, but I personally use uh, a suite of very uh, of uh, different browser plugins. There's lots of great testing tools, automated ones and non-automated. We also did manually testing with only a keyboard. And also, and this is super important, it's amazing how many people forget this, asking people with disabilities to help us test. Uh, I have um, my certifications. I know how to do a lot of accessibility testing. I know how to test with a screen reader, but I am not a daily screen reader user. You always need to test. You need to have the uh, help of user testing with people who use those devices on a daily basis. Those are the people who will find the issues that um, even an accessibility testing expert who does have those disabilities will not find. So super important. So where did we end up? These are uh, two screenshots of the navigation, the new navigation menu, um, one with the without a dropdown, one with the dropdown open. The top level links are now uh, buttons. So buttons are, uh, are uh, fully keyboard accessible all on their own. They don't need any, any special markup. Uh, they're also, it, this also means there are not hover menus. There are no hover menus here. You click and you get a drop down menu. These links are very short. I actually thought to have them even shorter, but um, uh, I am satisfied with uh, how relatively short these links are. The uh, contrast is very high, so we cleared the um, uh, contrast guidelines and they are fully navigable with a keyboard. They behave in predictable ways by keyboard users. So not only do you get the drop down when you click on the button, uh, when, you, when you click the button, when you hit the tab next, you automatically tab into the drop down menu. And when you tab out of the drop down menu, it automatically goes away. You don't have to tell it um, to go away. Um, and it has full support for screen readers as well. And just it's easier on the eyes. It is cleaner. It's easier to look at for cognitive processing, this navigation menu is a uh, vast improvement. Uh, and we applied this um, all the way across the site. I'm not gonna dive too much into this, but these are our uh, respective search bars. Searching the library catalog is most of what people wanna do when they come to our site. 
On the top, we have the old one. On the bottom, we have the new one. The old one has a lot of the same issues that the old navigation menu has, and the bottom one improves on this by um, adhering to the guidelines, being accessible to keyboards, lowering the cognitive load, and uh, being screen reader um, uh, screen reader accessible as well. So there are very practical reasons for adopting an accessibility uh, mindset, not just all the great stuff that I've been talking about, but also because retrofitting for accessibility, if you um, have to work backwards to make something accessible that is not, it takes more time and costs more money than starting with accessibility at the beginning. Also, retroactive fixes are difficult to maintain over the long term and increase an application's fragility. So if you are having to retrofit and add more code, these, your application gets more fragile. There's more opportunities for it to break. You have to keep track of all of those changes, so it just gets more difficult to maintain. And uh, most importantly, to people higher up the ladder, and this is often your biggest leverage if you are lower down the ladder and you are trying to convince your higher ups that accessibility is necessary, you are less likely to be sued. And uh, I have direct experience of this at uh, UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley is now in a consent decree with the Department of Justice. We did get sued for very, very good reasons. We have milestones that we need to be hitting over the next few months to get all of our public facing websites fully accessible. UC Berkeley is learning this lesson the hard way. So if you work for an organization where you are trying to convince people that accessibility is a necessary thing, the money is often the most convincing thing. I wish that were not the case. We live under capitalism. Money is the motivator a lot of the time. So telling someone that they might get sued under the ADA, that's often the most motivating thing. Don't be afraid to leverage that particular item. So these questions, who is this for? Who is able to use it? We can ask that question about all the kinds of technology, all of aspects of the built environment um, in our world. The world becomes a very different place when you start asking these questions. You start to see everything through a different lens. And on this picture, on this uh, slide, I have four pictures. Again, I will go clockwise. On the top left, we have uh, an iPhone. Who is this for? Who is able to use it? iPhones actually have a lot of really great accessibility features. So lots of people are able to use that iPhone. Top right, we have a movie theater. Movie theaters these days now have really great accessibility features. This particular movie theater has spaces for wheelchairs. The seats are very wide, so they are not difficult to get out of. There are stairs, but there are handrails at the bottom of those stairs for people who need it. But most importantly, there are places for people to sit who cannot get to the stairs and plenty of room for them to maneuver around so that they're able to enjoy the movie without having to go upstairs or wedge themselves into seats that they can't get into. And there's also, um, uh, there uh, are also um, features for people who are visually impaired. Bottom right, we have a BART train. BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System. That's a transit system that I'm most uh, familiar with. Matt's transit systems have lots of great accessibility features. If you start looking around for them, you can see the spaces for the wheelchairs. You can see areas where there's Braille. At uh, the stops, there are signs. There are people also um, announcing the stops so that deaf people know where they are and he other hearing impaired people, visually impaired people. Um, lots of really great features. This particular train platform has uh, right by the edge a set of raised bumps so that visually impaired people using uh, the canes are able to tell when they are near the edge of the platform. That also provides traction for people who need it. And then bottom left, we have a uh, row of bank ATMs. Uh, banks have been sued up the wazoo for accessibility because people got to get their money. So ATMs have a lot of really amazing accessibility features. Um, you can get your wheelchair up to an ATM, turn it sideways, access all the features. Things are at a height for wheelchair users to be able to use. The buttons have raised numbers so you can feel them. They also have Braille. They have... Um, um, audio inputs, so people who need hearing devices can actually plug in uh, whatever device they need. There's all kinds of features. 
So when you start asking these questions as you move about the world, you start seeing the world in a different way and you start seeing what is accessible to everybody, what things are not accessible to everyone, what things have had the thought and the time spent on in order to make them accessible for everyone. And you can also start applying these questions to your own work as you are working on the things that you work on, on the things you build, whatever you happen to build, who is it for? and who is able to use it. Because at the end, at the end of the day, who is able to use it is the same as who it ends up being for. These end up being the same thing. You may have intended it to be for everyone. You may have inadvertently caused it to only be for certain people. And our goal is to make the things that we build and the things we create usable for absolutely everybody. So that is the end of me yammering on about the accessibility mindset. Um, thank you for listening to me and watching my slides. Um, if there are comments or questions now, Andrew, I would be happy to take them. Yes, we have about nine minutes left. So uh, first off, uh, I just want to say two things. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey and making the University of California Berkeley Library accessible. Uh, you're on the front line and that's real impact. And I just wanna thank you for the journey. Thank you for being brave enough to show where you were and where you are today. So I really appreciate that. Um, the second thing, uh, back to your slide with the movie theaters, I do wanna say this, that there is a movie theater by me that has sensory show times. What that means is that they have the lights up, they have lower volume, and they have a friendly environment and they say on their website to stand up, talk and sing. So they have very, very certain times where it's it's for uh, sensory folks to come and enjoy movies. So I just wanna say that that is an option at a theater by me. If it's not by you, you might just have to ask and tell them to advertise it or request it because to me, that's a great way for movie theaters to, to have everybody who is that for? A movie is for everybody. So allowing people to have space to enjoy it how they they choose to enjoy it. With that, um, we have some questions. So the first one is, the question is up on the screen. What app or website have you personally used that delighted you by providing an inclusive digital experience? Uh, that is a great question. And I especially like that question because naturally I spend most of my time thinking about the websites that don't. <laughs> Uh, and that uh, bugged me. Um, uh, the, the, the first one that pops into my mind, actually, and uh, this won't be a surprise, but the uh, Level Access website is great. And Level Access is, of course, an um, organization uh, that uh, provides tools and consulting for um, digital accessibility digital accessibility. So of course, their website is um, going to be accessible. Um, but it's accessible on a lot of really great levels. And of course, the one that I'm in, always initially the most sensitive to is um, the cognitive load that a website um, demands of, of me as a user. And level access is, is just great. It's super clean. Uh, as you scroll through, you the, what is occupied in um, the visual field is is what you want to look at or what you need to look at right now without too much noise. Um, it also doesn't sacrifice uh, the, the pleasure of visual design in that goal because, of course, a lot of us who work on uh, accessibility when we work with design de 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 departments, that's a, a place where we can bump heads a lot because a lot of the designers want, I want this pretty thing, I want this color, I want that, and you're saying as the accessibility expert, no, 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 you, you can't do that. Um, but there's a lot of really great ground to be met there, and I feel like the Level Access site does that really well. And of course, it's fully keyboard accessible and screen reader accessible. So that's uh, that's that's the, the low-hanging fruit one that I'll, that I'll put out there. Thanks for saying that. I will reiterate uh, that space is such a great design tool for those of us that are sighted. Uh, and to to work with stakeholders to embrace space has been uh, a challenge of throughout my career, uh, I will say, as a front-end developer. We'll have one more question, I think, and then uh, I want to give you space to answer this. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with a few slides. So there, there are other questions. Feel free to reach out to Jesse. Um, 
but we'll just take one more here. So the question is on the screen right now, it says, did you engage students to test the new website? Yes, most definitely. So um, unlike the, uh, the the process that was gone through for the, or the old website that I um, showed you for the new one, we with our vendor, we went through the process of uh, identifying our uh, audiences. We went through that process of identifying user personas, as they say, and of course, students was was one of the uh, the largest. And we even broke that down into undergraduate students and graduate students because they they came to our websites with different needs uh, and are looking for for different things. Uh, so yes, the answer is is yes, we did because one of our biggest goals was to make our websites. Uh, usable by the people that we identified as as the users. So short answer to your question, but yes, we did. That's great. And I also love your mission statement and how that level sets you to the work that you do. So uh, I think that's a wonderful mission statement. And once again, I just want to thank you for sharing today. Uh, really great advice. I thought it was a very unique way uh, to talk about how to bring digital accessibility to everything. So I really appreciate your perspective and really enjoyed the talk today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm also excited about what's coming next for Alley Talks. So next month in March, we have another talk and it's about accommodating neurodivergent learners. And this is with Star Peterson. And it's gonna be on March 13th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So don't miss that. Or the great thing about these live streams is if you do miss it, you can watch it anytime. And uh, the only thing is you won't be able to engage and ask questions. And I just want to thank everybody for their questions today as well. So we are always looking for speakers. Even though we have a great lineup, we always uh, need some more. And it would be great to fill out the rest of this year with some really, really great speakers. So please visit our website, alleytalks.com and check out our page about how you can speak and how uh, we can engage you and come up with a great topic to present. Please follow us and subscribe. You're on YouTube right now and the Accessibility Talks channel. There's plenty of talks uh, in the past that you can watch. One other thing about those talks is we are, uh, for those of you that have IAAP certifications, you can, um, speakers and attendees can get professional development credits through IAAP for your continuing education. So just know that. Um, but please follow us and subscribe at all the things on YouTube, on X, on Mastodon. We are in all the places. And with that, I just want to thank everybody again, and we will see you next month. Thanks for attending.